Wow. Good morning. My name means son of the hooded one. <laughs> I'm looking forward to a new name as well. Right. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, let me begin in order of prayer, please. Father, uh, we recognize that uh, you are the giver of all life. All good comes from you. All hope is rooted in you. And as we just got done singing, all praise belongs to you. We give you praise for allowing us to uh, be considered your friend. I think that's what your son said. He said, I no longer see yourselves as my slaves or as my servants. I want you to be my friend. That's sometimes hard for us, and yet uh, you knew what this world was like. Uh, you entered it with us uh, in your son Jesus, and you made those confusing places make sense. And I pray that I will not get in the way of what you have to say to us this morning. I thank you for this time. I thank you for this freedom. I thank you for life and medicine and resources and we live in this abundant place and we have first world problems but the world is aching in a lot of ways and we pray that we can be part of the solution and not just part of the problem so thank you thank you for your word both written and incarnate that instructs us and grants us access to pure freedom and real joy in every circumstance we find ourselves. So, grant us the ability to uh, get out of the way, hear what your spirit says. And I pray this in your son's name, the strong and gentle name of Jesus. Amen. I have a tendency to get stuck in some ideas. I'll run across an idea and then I begin to chew on it and ruminate on it and if nothing interferes I do that maybe too much but I get stuck on some ideas. I grew up in the church and I was taught a certain kind of way and I've spent most of my adult life unraveling that in some way. Not discarding it, not throwing it away but unraveling the mixture that I was taught. I was taught what I call often a deadly mixture it was a mixture of true truth mixed with some kind of fallacious argument, something that tried to make sense or something that somebody was taught in a theology class somewhere and it didn't. But I struggled in the back, just even as a kid, to make sense out of a lot of things. A lot of things that were set up front that didn't make sense to me. And I'm still discovering and tripping over those and wondering about them. So this morning I want to talk about how we have a tendency, I think, to be binary in our thinking. We have very good examples from 2020 of how easy it is to be polarized. All you have to do is just talk just a little bit about politics and people understand what you're talking about. People were po polarized in families so much so that they couldn't even have conversations. I'm actually writing a little series now on the difference between dialogue and debate because I think all we are left with is debate. We don't know how to have dialogue. And so when your pastor just talked to you about friendship and having conversation, how important relationships are, they're important simply because we can dialogue. Dialogue means that you can communicate. That's how God created the world. He created it with language and words, and he spoke it into being. And we need to learn how to use words to connect with people and understand people and cry with people and support people and praise God in the process of delighting in who we are and who we have a tendency to ignore sometimes or take for granted in our lives. We're not given tomorrow. We're just given today. And so this is hard because we want answers. We want answers to COVID. We want answers to political problems. I read last night just a little bit because I couldn't concentrate on anything else. I was reading about uh, what's going on in Israel, and it's just disturbing. That's all. I, how else do you say it? I'm not sure I understand it. I get the words I'm reading, but I'm not sure I trust the information I get. 
but I want an answer. I kind of long for that. I think that'll give you a sense of relief, won't it? So what I want to talk to you about is something that poses just the opposite. It says that this is not an answer book. This is a book about relationship. This is a book about relationship with each other and with the holy. And a relationship, by definition, is messy. Maybe that should be the title. I don't know, you know. Loving messy or something like that because it just is messy. Now, I've taught quite a bit and I taught through the parables because I thought that would be a good thing as a pastor to do. And they were interesting and they were fascinating to me and there's a lot written about them. Jesus taught in parables. And we still scratch our heads because they, you can use them a jillion different ways. If you're a teacher, you just love them because they're just fruitful for any hobby horse you want to ride. And I'm riding one this morning that's my favorite, so you just have to ride with me, I guess. But along with parables are, is this whole cluster of teachings from Jesus that are paradoxical. And most of us don't like to hear that because paradoxes are seemingly unresolvable opposites. Things that don't fit, don't make sense, don't come clean, don't, aren't crisp and neat and a little packaged. They're messy. My world is messy. I work at a job that keeps me in messy all the time. I'm a psychologist as well as a minister. And I've been 55 years listening to people's pain and struggles and suffering and agony. And I listened to a sermon from last week here. It wasn't all that painful to listen to, but it was about suffering. <laughs> Since I have the microphone at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll leave you alone. Okay. <laughs> but, and we talk about suffering, and I listen to suffering, and I want to do something with it. And so this morning, I'm going to offer you a possible way to think about it that's a little bit different, that's practical, but you're going to have to wait till the end to get there. Okay? But I, I have a hard time making things practical. My daughter says, Dad, I love this. I get it. It makes sense to me. Now, how does it apply? So this is my big effort to try to make this apply in some way. I'm reading a passage of scripture called uh, Romans. And so if you have your Bible, you can turn to Romans. If you don't have your Bible, you can just pretend you have your Bible. And trust that I'm actually reading it correctly. Romans is where Paul talks about some big theological constructs. He teaches in his epistles, they're usually short and pithy and directed, and he splits them in two, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, for instance. He splits them in two, and he has a, a theological abstract side, and he has a practical side. And the practical side in Romans comes later. There's 16 chapters in Romans, and the practical side really doesn't show up until about chapter 12. So it takes 11 chapters to talk about theory, 11 chapters to talk about perspective, 11 chapters to help us understand who we are as believers. You sang about it this morning. You sang about identity, and you talked about those kind of things, which is really important. So in the first four chapters of Romans, this is HUD's deal, I think all he's telling us is this is what it takes to become a follower of Jesus. This is what it takes to be born again. This is what it takes to come alive as a spiritual being the way God made you to be. This is called justification theologically, and the first four chapters are about how you're justified by faith, through grace, alone. End of sentence. You're made new. You moved from death to life. I've heard that my whole life, death to life. Okay, well, good. What does that mean? Well, what the message I got was you've got to hang on to death as well because we have to motivate you by this. We have to scare you or, or something. We have to shame you in some way to get you to change or develop in some way. And we don't get the life part a lot of times. 
But we sang about it this morning, and I thank you, praise team, because I think that's, this is something we come to church for. We come to church so that we can praise God, so that we can see his glory, so that we can understand his majesty, so that we can kind of be overwhelmed by the fact that he is God and there is no other, and he is worthy of our worship, and he's the only being in all the universe that's worthy of our worship. And we, we do all that, and that positive things are really exciting, right? But it doesn't last a lot of times. Monday we run into reality, we say, and reality is usually pretty harsh and gruesome and difficult and challenging, and it comes from all kinds of things, from financial issues and physical issues and emotional issues and relational issues and cultural issues and on and on you go, right? And then we run back to church and we try to get another dose of praise and worship. <laughs> nice. So Paul says this in chapter 5. He says, now, you've become a new creature. The old things are dead. Actually, he says the old things are dead 32 times in the next four chapters, 5, 6, 7, and 8. He knows we're not going to get it. He knows we want to keep this old man alive. We want to hold on to what we already have. We don't want to let go of it. I have a heart pacemaker, and the reason I have it is because my heart rate was too slow. It got down to 28 beats a minute, and you can't function at 28 beats a minute very well. And so that was my excuse anyway. And so they gave me a blood thinner, and I didn't want to take the blood thinner. Maybe you've had this experience. I didn't want to, so I pushed against it. I, didn't, I kind of griped and complained, and I kind of yelled at the doc, and he said, well, you still need it, you know, because you don't want to have a stroke, right? So I don't want to have a stroke, but I don't want the blood thinner. So I'm caught in this dilemma, so I'm taking the blood thinner, and I'm complaining. Inside, I'm complaining. Outside, I'm complaining. Any chance I get, I complain, but it didn't seem to matter. So after about a year or something, I went back to the doc and I had something and he just, as a throwaway comment, I'm sitting on the bench or wherever they sit you in those silly rooms on paper, right? You're sitting on a piece of paper. <coughs> and he said, uh, uh, you can stop taking that. You know what happened inside of me? I said, don't take that away. <laughs> I'm kind of adjusted to it now. It's mine. <laughs> I don't want to lose it. And I thought, you idiot, what are you thinking? You know, you wanted to get rid of this. You spent a whole year complaining. Why don't you let go of it in some way? So Paul's telling us, he says, let go of the old man. He's dead. And he knows he's going to have trouble convincing us. So he repeats that over and over and over and over again, that theme. And so if you go through the next four chapters, five, six, seven, and eight, where he's telling us how to live Christian life, says, the old man's dead, really dead. So I'm going to tell you how the new man's supposed to function. And here's how he starts this. And it just hit me pretty strong, so follow me here. Therefore, chapter 5, verse 1, Romans, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. The word peace means to be at one again. Interesting word. It means that we are fragmented. That's what happened at the fall. The fall busted things and split them and shattered them and separated them and divorced them and fragmented them. Being at peace means what? Reintegrating those things, putting them back together, picking up the pieces and, and repositioning them the way they're designed to be. He repeats this idea over and over. So Paul knows that we need to have this message told us over and over and over again. In Romans 8, he says, life in the spirit, it comes with life and peace. Spiritual following God means that you, if you live by the spirit, you will have access to life and peace. Life in abundance, God says. You know, you'll have trouble in the world, but take heart. I've overcome the world, right? I have come into the world to, in opposition to the oppressor who wants to steal, kill, and destroy you. But I've come that you may have life, what? In full, he says. 
Well, I sat in the church for years, and I looked around. I didn't see very many people having life in full. I saw them all in pieces, kind of. You know, they'd come to praise and worship, and then they'd go away, and then they had this bad deal in their life, and they couldn't reconcile the two. So to the, today I want to talk about those paradoxes, the one in your own life as well. But So he's, he tells you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. So we could spend a whole year talking about grace, and we could spend another year talking about the peace we just talked about. They're so fundamental to the Christian life. And he's telling you, now this is how you're going to live. You need to keep in mind that you have access to peace all the time, and you have grace that is sufficient. He tells the very author of this book later, it is sufficient. Now look at what he says, in which we stand. And we exalt. Now the word exalt is kind of a fun word. It actually means to celebrate. You did a little bit of that this morning. You were good. I liked it. We didn't hesitate. We got it on. It, you know, it was nice, right? So celebrate is one of the words. It might The word exalt might mean rejoice. And it might mean boast. And it might mean shout. And it might mean praise. But it's not a passive word. You are to exalt in what? Here's what the text says. You are to exalt in hope of the glory of God. Now, I honestly think that this is the binary thing we do in church. We come to church to exalt in the hope of the glory of God. Yea, God. You know, isn't that what we do? We, just, we are here so that we can be built up, we think, and to feel better and to be stronger. Wow. I thought, wow, well, okay, thanks, Paul. This is how the Christian life is supposed to be lived. So people should be exalting and praising and celebrating. Look at the next sentence. And not only this, but we also exalt the same word, celebrate, rejoice, celebrate what? Our tribulations. Now just let that sink in a bit. Tribulation, glory. Exalt in both, at the same time, always till the Lord returns. How does he start to tell us about the Christian life? He, he says, now you're justified. Here's what sanctified life looks like. Here's what living the Christian life is. And look at how he anchors it at the very, very first mention of what it means to work, live, and be a believer, a follower of Jesus. You are going to be facing Glory every moment and simultaneously tribulation every moment. Don't make them binary. Don't polarize them. Don't push them apart. Don't do one at one time and one at another. Pull them together. Put an and in between them that connects them rather than separates them. Do you celebrate Tribulation as much as you celebrate glory? Just asking. Pedestrian question while I'm musing, you know, running through my life a little bit. We don't like conflict. We think we should get rid of it. In my business, we have all this stuff that we say you, you need to learn how to manage your conflict. So we have conflict management. Or you need to learn how to manage your anger. So we have anger management. And so, you know, what are we doing? We're trying to give people a way to not have to celebrate tribulation. Those words clash in my mind. But so do the ideas that Paul just starts out with and puts together. You have to celebrate glory and celebrate tribulation at the same time. So. What you did for me this morning was you celebrated glory here 
And I'm going to try to celebrate tribulation here for a bit. Just walk with me some. Tribulation is stuff like anxiety or depression or stress or pain or transition or change or difficulties or suffering or affliction. How am I doing? My thesaurus just ran out. But I mean, it's that's life, isn't it? The car breaks down. You have to maintain this. I, I, I am unbelievably irritated by how much stuff needs maintenance. From taking the trash out, which is never ending, by the way, to, to I don't know, to, to, to refilling the Kleenex box. You know, I mean, it's just, what? I just ran out of toilet paper again. What? You know? It's maintenance, right? It's a nuisance. Maybe it doesn't come under the whole rubric of tribulation, but I think it kind of fits in there a little bit. Because we complain about it, don't we? And it's irritating, and it's, and I don't want to do it. And, have, you know, I'm old enough now, thanks for bringing this up. I'm old enough now that just getting ready for bed is really a challenge. I mean, it's just this horrific list of things I have to do, you know. Brushing my teeth is a six-part process, you know, really. <laughs> well, how did it get that way, you know? Can't it just be simple? Well, there's some people, by the way, that are very positive. We call them optimists, and they won't look at the dark side of anything, you know. Glass half full, right? And then there's some of you out there that Last half, empty, everything's negative. Well, guess which side I'm on most of the time. I am so sarcastic and, and kind of bent toward the negative. I don't trust very well. It's hard for me to do that. And, it, and I, you know, I could tell you some stories about why I think I don't trust, but it's just hard to trust. It is. It's hard to trust. And, and people let you down all the time, and they don't know. They can't trust themselves. And I know enough about me, I can't trust myself. And so, you know, on and on we go, right? It's difficult. So, but optimism and pessimism both make the same mistake in opposite directions. They miss reality accurately. And all Paul is telling us is the accurate view of reality holds intention, glory, and tribulation at the same time. You don't have to seek tribulation, guys. It's here. But you do have to hold them together. And what I want to give you at the very end of this is a bridge to pull them together. But just walk with me for a moment, thinking about where this paradox shows up. We don't have time. Uh, you do the Lord's Prayer. And in the Lord's Prayer, there's this, this is what HUD does with this stuff. In the Lord's Prayer, there's this line. And the line says, on earth as it is in heaven. Hmm. Interesting phrase. Give us this day our daily bread, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then there's this little thing on earth as it is in heaven. The direction of God and his blessings proceed from heaven to earth. We must live our lives in the same way, and that's what the prayer is. I want to live my life here as it is in heaven. But the order is from heaven to earth. Is your brain okay? You following me? Every problem you have will be answered either in heaven or before. Do I need to say that again? <laughs> Every problem you have will be answered. Every tribulation you have will be confronted. Every difficulty you face will be embraced when? Either in heaven or before. So you don't live from the problem trying to get to heaven. What do you do? You live from the problem that's solved from the answer before the answer is even given to you. Paul says it this way. He says you're to walk by faith, not by sight. 
And that, by the way, comes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It's at the end of that chapter, and he's telling you uh, about suffering when he talks about that. Because he says, if you walk by sight, <laughs> you'll be not only encumbered, you'll be unable to run the race. Because what you see is not enough, because there's always more going on than you can see. How about you writing that somewhere? There's always more going on than you can see. Always more going on than you can know. And we live in a culture that's so high on information and knowledge and so trusted that it's killing us. Well, here's another th thought related to that, another paradox. The wilderness in the scriptures is part of the promised land. In the promised land is the wilderness of Judea, the wilderness of Arabah, the wilderness of the Negev, which alone makes up more than half of the land of Israel. Most of the promised land is the wilderness. The wilderness is also part of the promised land. It's called a paradox. <laughs> Are you following? You know, he says, if in your life you'll have wilderness times, hardship, losses, challenges, tears, times of waiting, simply not being in the place you want to be, in God even the wilderness is part of the promised land. Fascinating. I was in Israel a couple of years ago and... Uh, just fascinating to me that if you raise sheep, you raise them in the wilderness. And I, I, so I asked the guide, I said, where's the wilderness? And she said, right over that hill. By the way, they don't have mountains in Israel, even though they call them Mount this and Mount that. They're, I got to Mount Carmel, I was wildly underimpressed because I live in Colorado. <laughs> it's just a little bump. Even the wilderness is part of the promised land. In other words, the wilderness can be used by God for his purposes. God will use it to accomplish his purposes, to fulfill the calling and promise of your life. In God, even the wilderness becomes a place of blessing. Now, I'm, I'm pushing into it a little bit, so just keep listening to me. Don't leave. If God is with you, then your journey is also part of your destination. Everything counts. Nothing is wasted with God. Your life on earth is part of heaven. You're actually living eternally. Now, act like it. Live into that. Embrace that. Don't let these things separate. I know the pain people carry is grievous. Carry it. Consent to it. Don't fight it. You can hate it, yes, but embrace it. Because the minute you fail to embrace it, it takes on a life of its own and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Most mental illness is caused by people avoiding pain. If you have a headache, take an aspirin for pity's sake, but that's not what I'm talking about. Okay? Who Jesus, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. <laughs> okay. Well, how about this one? Lose your life to find it. Paradox? That's a fun one. By the way, I've never understood it. You probably won't understand it by the time I get done this morning, so just relax, you know. <laughs> Can you consent to difficulties? Can you embrace and accept the reality of that. Some of you had really bad upbringings. Can you 
embrace the fact that you had a bad upbringing and it's not about you, it's just something that happened. I've read voraciously on the Holocaust and man's inhumanity to man. It's part of my being a philosophy and history major undergraduate and I still am drawn to that and I keep reading stories. I just finished a couple this summer or this spring and I'm stunned. I am absolutely stunned by how people, few people, can embrace the reality that they're in. And the message keeps coming back. It's the same message I'm trying to give you this morning in a way. But believers have a unique access to some resources that nobody else has. And that's what Paul's trying to say here. He says, guess what? You have to exalt in tribute and in glory. And you have to, at the same time, learn how to exalt or celebrate tribulation. Even though you don't understand what's happening, you need to be able to hold on to it and, and what? Celebrate it. Oh my goodness. How do you celebrate being a paraplegic after you've broken your neck on a bike ride? What does it say in what Nick preached to you last week? In that very chapter, chapter 8, it says, all things work together. Yeah, for good, yeah. And I, I heard that in church my whole life, and I thought, well, that's nice. I don't know what it means, but it sure is nice. Because I could never apply it. I could never pull the two things together. I could never get them so that that made sense. You fear suffering, it'll get worse. We wish things were different, don't we? We complain. I'm a great complainer, by the way. I'm a, I'm a griper is what I am. Second Corinthians 4.17. This slight momentary affliction is preparing us for e the eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Listen to his language. Affliction, glory. He starts off talking about the Christian life with glory and affliction or glory and tribulation, same thing, right? Duplicates it. Romans 8. Romans 8 verse 18 says, For I consider the sufferings of the present time are not to be worthy to be compared with the glory. So he's got these two continually juxtaposed to one another and he keeps pushing them at us. Why? Because we have a natural tendency to separate them. We have a natural tendency to let them fall apart. We don't know how they can speak to one another. We're either in one or in the other. And the Bible says, no, pull them together, restore them. That's what the cross did essentially. Jesus endured the cross, but he agonized and cried for it to be taken away. He did not want that cup. He didn't want to drink from it. And he said so. You don't have to want this. You don't have to like it. A good friend of mine died when I was teaching. Uh, I was really young and he died of a tumor, brain tumor, and they couldn't treat it. And I didn't want to go visit him. I was a chicken. I just didn't want to go visit him. I didn't know what to say. You know, gosh, you're dying. Isn't that fun? I didn't know what to say to him. I didn't feel I had any words that, that I could comfort him with. Everybody was going and giving him verses and reading him psalms and blah, blah, blah. And I was, I just was without it. And Nancy said, you've got to see him. He's one of your better friends. Finally, I went. I remember standing at the door of his hospital room. He was the only one in the room, and I was just standing at the door, and I said, I hate this. And then I said, I think you can hate it, too. My third phrase was, I'm pretty sure God hates it. So I had three of us hating it. I thought that was pretty good. Now, I didn't know if I hated it because I just hated being there and didn't know what to say. That was possible and probably part of it. But I also hated the fact that evil was so represented in this process. Celebrate tribulation. Embrace it. Recognize it. Turn the light on. Don't expose it, if you will. Do expose it. Don't run away. 
our tendency to do this narrows our focus. Holiness expands your focus. Separating these two things narrows your focus. What Christians have access to that nobody else on the planet has is a wider view of reality. Okay, I've spent enough time with my introduction. <laughs> You're laughing. Why don't I find it funny? <laughs> I think we need to build a bridge, so here's the bridge. Just a little background. Joseph, Old Testament, human trafficked by his own family. Joseph, I would say, was in a tri tribulation time. He was in a troubling time. He was in a horrible time. I cannot get it. And I also simultaneously don't get how in the world did he keep his, his faith? How did he keep rooted? How did he stay anchored? How did he, what did he do? And by the way, the text doesn't give you much information, not about Joseph, in terms of what was going on inside of him and how he processed, right? Amazing guy. Absolutely amazing in terms of the way he managed his own character, etc. Uh, one thing you need to note here is that in, as Paul opens Romans 5, he says this about tribulation. He says, tribulation brings about perseverance. Perseverance, character, proven character, develops character. And out of character comes what? Hope. The very thing that we all need. But hope will not stand alone just on the praise side, just on the glory side. It's got to be connected with tribulation. Does that make sense? If it doesn't, if it's not connected, then it's not real hope. And Paul teaches that again. He teaches it in Romans 8 again. He says, you know, hope that is seen is not hope. Walk by faith, not by what? Sight. The Israelites got up against the Red Sea and the, here comes Pharaoh and they're despairing and they're, you know, and they get through it and they praise God. Listen to this, Exodus 14, they praise God like crazy, but they praised him on the wrong side of the water. You understand? They praised him after they were released from the fear, not in the middle of it. And how long did their praise last them? The, the last verse says that they believed and they trusted. Uh, read Exodus 14, I think it's verse 30, something, 2, 3. And it just says they praised and trusted God. And then what happened? <laughs> yeah, two, two, week, two days later or something, I mean, they're complaining. They're back in the same place. Because they were binary. They narrowed their focus. They based it on what they saw. And there was more going on. Okay. So, take a guy like Job. A little tribulation in his life. Any of you experienced what Job experienced? Lose all your kids? Lose your wealth? Lose your health? Lose, you know, a decent conversation with your wife? You know, I just, come on. Crazy story. If you read Job, you will stay confused pretty much because it's a confusing book. But God says at the end, he says, this guy chose relationship over knowledge, chose relationship over being binary, chose to stay in that space and embrace and celebrate tribulation. And God honors it. We know the end of the story when we start it, so we cheat. We don't get the feeling that's in the power of that. But he, he complained a lot, by the way, which is where I'm coming to, right? I think asking why 
asking how long, asking where are you, is necessary for you and I to learn how to celebrate tribulation. I think having questions and doubts and puzzlement about the holy and about what's going on, about why do you let this and why is that happening and where is that coming from, I think those are the kind of things that you and I have to voice and state or we're going to stay stuck on one side or the other and that binary side is Satan's playground. You put these two things together, as Paul suggests, and you will live differently. And I think the bridge is what I want to try to give you right now. It's called lament. David wrote half of the Psalms. A third of the Psalms that David wrote were lament Psalms. Do you know what a lament is? I wrote down here in my notes, humans suffer, believers lament. Non-believers can't lament, not functionally, because they don't have any place to go with it. They don't believe there's something bigger out there. We do. We trust that God's there, that he's absolutely good, that he's not playing a game with us, that he didn't cause cancer to us. We can learn from it. He can use it, but that's different than him making it happen. He's not an evil God. And most people think he is. He thinks he's because they made him binary, right? There's a good God and there's an angry God, and a bad God, kind of, you know. And so th this is the God that tries to teach you a lesson through giving you, you know, I don't know, a big foot or something. I don't know, whatever gets in the way. Lament actually shows belief. Why are the books in the Bible like Psalms or like Ecclesiastes? Ecclesiastes is essentially a lament. You just have to learn how to read it. Lamentations, obviously, is a lament. That's where the word comes from, right? If you lament, it shows that you believe. That's all. You may be confused. Here's what I wrote. Complaint bound to faith. So I'm complaining, but it's tied to faith. How about this? I'm confused, but I trust. I didn't get to hear you talk about Romans 7, but the last part of Romans 7 for me is Paul confessing to you that life is confusing here on this planet, and it's going to stay confusing, and he's going to tell you you're going to try everything in your power through every legal system you can do, legal system being something you can control, whether it's your, your knowledge or actually physically controlling the environment. But guess what? He's telling you that's normal for you as a believer because you can trust you can try the law of God, you can try the law of your mind, you can try the law, law of the members of your body, and you can try the law of sin, and none of those laws will be enough to bring resolution to your confusion. But guess what? Praise God through Christ Jesus. There is no separation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But we don't live in Romans 8. We don't live between those brackets. We ignore them, basically. So confusion messes with us, and we can't anchor it in trust so often. Or how about this one? Petition bound to allegiance. I am going to stay with God regardless. Please, can you take this from me? Please, can you remove this? Please, can you change this situation? You've got to cry out honestly and with integrity and authenticity and vulnerability, or you cannot wed the two things he's saying. Uh, just for fun, Ecclesiastes chapter 8 quickly says this. He says, uh, all this I have seen and applied, 8, 9. I've seen and applied, my mind, this is Koalath, he says, my mind to every deed that has been done under the sun where when man has exercised authority over another man to his hurt, so then I have seen the wicked buried. Those who used to go in and out from the holy place, and they are soon forgotten in the city where they did thus. This too is futility, because the sentence against an evil deed is executed quickly, therefore is not executed quickly. Therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are fully given to do evil, although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life. Still I know that it will be well for those who fear God. Listen to how he ends that. He says, still I know. It's the allegiance to what he knows. It's not the event. So I see the events. That's not, that's not just. There's plenty of injustice in our world. But he's telling you, guess what? I know 
that there's a better way. I know that the God I'm following is not indifferent or not blind or is not not paying attention. Okay, grief and betrayal. A lot of people are betrayed. They're hurt. They can't get past that. So grief and betrayal messes with us. David laments, Jesus, let this cup pass. Why have you forsaken me? The practice of lament is one of the most theologically informed things we can do. We believe, but we hurt. We know, but we question. We hope, but we suffer. It's messy. So a lament works this way. It has to end with confidence in the absolute goodness of God, in praise, which is what you started off to today. Okay. So here are the three things I want you to think about. If you lament, you're going to be saying, I believe you exist, God. I would not write a letter to you if I didn't think you existed. Hmm? <laughs> you don't call somebody if you don't think they exist. You can scream at the holy. He understands. Give him a chance. My dad died because he was afraid to lament. Now, that's a long story, but that's basically it. So if you want to hear a personal side of this story this morning, that's it. I don't want to follow my dad's footsteps. He loved Jesus. That's not the issue. But he didn't know how to lament. His wife died 15 years before he did, and he couldn't lament. Grief, by the way, turns you backwards. Lament turns you forwards. It's, it's the good grief that Paul talks about in Thessalonians. Don't grieve like the world grieves. Grieve in a different way. So I can't lament unless I believe you exist. The second thing the lament will say is what? I believe you are powerful. I won't complain to somebody I won't waste time complaining to somebody who, who doesn't have the power to change anything. I'm having trouble with my internet. I'm off the grid, living up in the mountains now, and the only way I can use my phone is through Wi-Fi because I don't have a cell signal. And I was without Wi-Fi for two weeks. And I talked to five people at my Wi-Fi supplier. I'm complaining now. Are you, get, you get this? I, to five people there, and they kept escalating it, and they kept asking me the same questions, and I kept getting the same irritation, you know. I, I was complaining to the wrong people. They had no power to change anything. Finally, somebody did. I won't complain if I know you can't affect any change. Lament means that I'm willing to complain, but I'm willing to complain because I trust that you can, you can affect the change. And the last thing is, I believe you love me. I believe that you enter into my pain. You enter into the evil in my life. You enter into the things that are impacting me, and you are about changing them. And it may be now, and it may be later, but it's, you are in that process with me. All I'm saying to you today, if, I, if you get one thing out of this, it would be, can you build a bridge between glory and tribulation in your life? Will you build a bridge between glory and tribulation? Will you take the risk? Will you stop thinking in a binary way like our culture does? Will you stop asking for answers when there's no questions really being addressed? We need to keep asking. And we need to show a faithful way to do what Paul's saying here, exalt in glory and exalt in tribulation. Pray with me, will you? Father, I am grateful for your word that presents life in its fullness with its complexity and its uh, 
puzzlement and its confusion and its uh, fuzziness, its its messiness, its the amorphousness that I can't see what's going on. I don't know what's happening. And I thank you that you made me a faith-based creature and you asked me to come to you in faith, believing. Jesus laid down his life intentionally he consented to the cross help us to intentionally consent to the cross as we're called to carry and honor you in so doing because we don't lose anchor point trust in your glory thank you for your son whose work gives us that hope and access to the hope we all long for. Hope, not in a binary thinking, but hope in a redeemed, integrated wholeness that you bring us back to yet once again. We give you praise for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen.